Uh, well, it's a great uh, uh, privilege and pleasure to welcome Warren Farr to talk to us today about the benefits he's discovered from using system dynamics to help on planning for a uh, smaller business, which he's going to tell us all about. So over to you, Warren. Okay. Uh, Kim, thank you very much. And I want to say how pleased and honored I am to be with you here today to, um, to talk about my experiences, although I will say that if you're listening to this recording, uh, I'm not actually with you right now that we've been forced to go to our backup plan, uh, but hopefully that won't be necessary. Uh, but my goal is to talk about the use that I've had of system dynamics in a smaller to medium-sized business and uh, hopefully give you some insights. So with that, I would like to talk a little bit first about um, Refrigeration Sales Corporation, which you can see in the picture here. This is our, our main location. It's a building that's about 135,000 square feet located outside of Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. The business, uh, Refrigeration Sales Corporation, or RSC, is a wholesale business. And uh, we're a wholesaler of heating, ventilating, air conditioning, and refrigeration, or what we call HVACR. We sell equipment, we sell the parts, uh, both generic and proprietary parts, and supplies that go along inside of those. Wholesale business is pretty simple. We, we buy things from the manufacturers, we store them and make them available to the local marketplace, and then we facilitate the sale. Uh, we currently buy from over 500 different manufacturers. I think we stock uh, close to 25,000 different stock keeping units, although we have access to many more products than that, and we sell to close to 3,000 different uh, contracting, local contracting businesses in our, in our area. Um, we sell residential, commercial, and industrial products, pretty wide range of products. And refrigeration sales is a third generation closely held business, which becomes interesting as we look at the overall uh, industry life cycle curve, which was, was a part of uh, the modeling efforts that I've done. Along the bottom, I've tried to give you some examples of the, the, the products, just a few. On the left-hand side, you'll see a very spiffy uh, service technician. This would represent one of our customers, somebody who would come to your home and install an air conditioning or a furnace, like an uh, air conditioning unit or a furnace, like you see next to him. Moving to the right, there's a small ice machine, uh, including a bin with some ice in it on the top, like you might see in a hospital or a hotel. Moving to the right, you can see the roof of a commercial building, maybe a restaurant, maybe a store, maybe an office complex where multiple rooftop units that provide the heating and cooling uh, to that facility would be located. And then to the right of that, I tried to show you the inside of one of these devices with uh, the identification of some of the parts that are typical, motors, wiring harnesses, burners, uh, valves, all those kinds of things um, exist in these units. So uh, what is the refrigeration sales reason for being? I hinted at it earlier. Uh, we do provide value in the local marketplace. We, we provide the local product availability. I, I should say, though, that we do not carry any appliances, something like a refrigerator, a self-contained appliance that you could go to the local store, they deliver it, take away your old one. We don't add any value there. The products we sell are engineered and installed in the field, in your home, in, in the industrial space, whatever. So we provide the local product availability to the various contracting firms. We facilitate credit. Uh, these are typically small companies, and uh, they require credit. We provide 24-hour technical assistance, either over the phone or, or many cases in person uh, when it's required. And we provide a tremendous amount of technical and sales training. Uh, very hands-on stuff. So looking at the, at the right top, there's a picture of a typical store. We try and keep them very bright, very clean, very colorful, very much like a retail operation, although they are wholesale, including uh, you can see a, a kind of typical customer that would come in and have questions and pick up parts. Directly below that, uh, this is a, our main warehousing facility. In total, it's about 100,000 square feet. And uh, from this facility, we would uh, do daily deliveries to all of our locations throughout, throughout the region. And then moving to the left, here's an example of one of our um, hands-on training classrooms. We have three of these where, where uh, our customers can actually tear down equipment and rebuild it under the supervision of our trainers before they would get uh, out into the actual retail space. 
Now, our region you can think of as the state of Ohio within the United States. Uh, our manufacturers are very, very boundary driven, and so we serve uh, the counties and the cities within the state within the state of Ohio. Okay. Uh, and how many uh, how many of those uh, contractors might you train in a, in a month? Our training classes would cover. That's a great question. Several hundred in a year. Our training season is in the cold months that we're having now because the summer months actually are busier uh, times. So this is really our training season. We do most of our training in the evening. And I would say, say 250 or so separate entities. All right, so having introduced the company, just trying to give you a little background for who we are and what we do. And of course, we're in the channel, so there are uh, lots and lots of interesting dynamics. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Warren Farr. That's a, a picture of me. Um, I am President and CEO of Refrigeration Sales Corporation, where I've worked since 1993. Uh, my, my first formal education was a, a bachelor's in computers and a minor in physics uh, from Duke University in 1984. And I have to tell you, I was a, a real nerd. I, I just absolutely love computers and, and technical things. Um, since then, I have uh, received an MBA from Duke University in, in 1993. Prior to receiving my MBA, however, and, uh, and the work I did after, after my bachelor's degree was in the technology area. I was uh, both in the software and the hardware areas as well as product management. I think the most interesting thing for me in, in this area is that my first job out of college was at a company called MITRE Corporation, which is unfamiliar to many. but MITRE was formed by a gentleman by the name of Bob Everett, and Bob was the deputy director, I'm sorry, the, uh, the junior director, the second in command to Jay Forrester at um, Lincoln Laboratories. And the MITRE Corporation was founded for the purpose of continuing the funding and oversight of these large government projects such as Whirlwind and the uh, SAGE Air Defense System. I was introduced to system dynamics at MIT in the year 2001 and became absolutely addicted. If there was something between me and the world that just didn't feel right. And uh, when I was introduced to system dynamics uh, via John Sturman at a seminar at MIT, somehow it sort of set the world straight for me. It, it put me back into, into harmony, it gave me a way of looking at the world that, um, that made so much sense. And so I immediately began applying it to everything I could. And, and at some point later, I, uh, uh, I did join the System Dynamics Society and been coming to conferences on a regular basis, but also enrolled in the WPI, Worcester Polytechnic um, System Dynamics Master's Program. And while I'm only able to take a class or two a year, uh, I am progressing through that, that program. And indeed, that's how I met uh, Tim Warren and one of his classes, Strategy Dynamics. All right, so as I approach this presentation, the big question for me was to talk about system dynamics like people do at the conference or whether to talk about system dynamics in business. And I came to it the conclusion pretty quickly that there are many, many more people that are, that are much better qualified to talk about the details of a system dynamics model. And that what I would really like to focus on and share with you are my insights about applying system dynamics, especially in a smaller, um, smaller or to medium-sized business. So I'm issuing you a warning. You know, be, be forewarned, this is not going to be your typical model presentation. Having said that, I will give you a brief model description, um, which I think really helps to set the background. But where I'd like to spend my time is I'd like to uh, focus on my experience using system dynamics in business. And uh, that is, what are my insights about using these tools how do I approach, specifically approach uh, peers and or managers within my business about using or the results of these tools? And uh, where do I see we've benefited the most? What, what, are, the, what are the activities around system dynamics where, where we've benefited? The main purpose of this model, this, this most recent model that I've created, was um, to gain a better understanding of two discretionary management variables. We spend a, a tremendous amount of money on marketing. And, Two particular areas we spend it in uh, is on consumer advertising and uh, contractor loyalty. And they're very different. Consumer advertising is about advertising the, 
brand of heating and cooling. In our case, that would be the carrier brand, a worldwide known, known brand. But the idea is getting the name out there pulls uh, the product through because the consumer wants the carrier brand. And, and spending money on that advertising is one decision variable. The second decision variable is, well, it may be that the contractor is influencing the consumer as to what brand they should buy. And so there are many, many uh, programs that we could institute, loyalty, purchasing loyalty programs, including trips or margin programs where they can earn discounts that would, um, that would convince a contractor to be more loyal. And the issue is we really can't spend on both to the extent we'd like. So the model was designed around trying to figure out uh, which one of these would be a better, a better spend. So, so you only carry the one brand, Warren, is that right? We, we do carry that. multiple brands, um, but this is our lead brand. It, the carrier is, the other brands are only channel brands. There really isn't a, a consumer brand recognition. So this question doesn't come into play. Um, so the reference mode was a decreased effectiveness in the advertising spend. In other words, we're putting the same or more money into this consumer advertising spend but it doesn't, it, it is not generating um, the sales like it used to. We're not seeing the same effectiveness. Um, and the dy dynamic hypothesis was this, that while the consumer advertising was a critical expense during the earlier part of the adoption phase of this industry where people were buying, say, air conditioning for the first time and, and the brands were relatively unknown. It was a bigger risk. It was a bigger part of their household income. They wanted some assurances of a big brand like, uh, you know, like Carrier, like IBM used to be to computers. While uh, as the industry matured and more and more people have air conditioning and really it's more a process of replacing that air conditioner, the consumer brand name awareness may not have as much to do with the sale. It may be more about what the contractor is recommending you replace this carrier unit with. And so the contractor loyalty spend may become more important as the industry matures. And that was the basic dynamic hypothesis, but you know, sorting out all the details was the, um, was the subject of the model. So I'm gonna show you a couple of sectors of this model, and, and I'm gonna walk through them um, uh, as I would with one of my managers. This is the first sector, and this represents the homes and the units that are installed in the homes. So it's homes without air conditioning or homes with air conditioning. And, um, so we're beginning on the left with homeowners that are, uh, air conditioning is, is not a part of, a big part of society, and so these are unaware homeowners. And they become potential homeowners as the cost of air conditioning becomes a smaller and smaller part of the household budget. Um, once they're potential homeowners there, the box in the center of the chart, they can either go up and adopt a carrier branded air conditioning unit or they go down and adopt a rival brand air conditioning unit. Uh, so at this point, they do have air conditioning and it's a matter of how long the air conditioning will last, the normal service life, which I have is about 15 years. As the unit ages, it then becomes a home needing air conditioning replacement in the middle on the far right. And then it enters this kind of loop where it gets replaced and it either becomes another home with carrier or it becomes a home with the rival brand. And so you can see the, the, the homes flow from the left over to the right and then they enter this, this kind of figure eight depending on how many times they switch brands. The adoption of air conditioning for the first time as a word of mouth process and an advertising process. And that's really where the advertising spend comes. So when a home is uh, deciding whether to get air conditioning or not and what brand, they're basing those decisions on word of mouth and advertising. And then as a home is replacing, the dynamic hypothesis is that the replacement has to do with uh, contractor loyalty and, and what is there, there is a brand predisposition, for, potentially, but what is the contractor doing in the in-home in sales? And so you can see the brand rivalry that's being set up here in the home sector of the model. 
So you, you've got that um, that little uh, item in the middle there, carrier contractor shares. So that's saying how much of the or what fraction of the car of the contractors are actually recommending that brand as opposed to others, and that's what uh, you suspect is most important in the replacement uh, market, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And and the next sector uh, helps to explain that because that's um, a combination of things. The carrier contractor share could be a combination of contractors that are loyal to carrier 100% and then those that are disloyal and we may only sell them uh, 5% or maybe 75% of what what they sell. This, um, this looks more as though it's uh, tracking a very long history of the industry and going a few years out into the into the future. Is, is that right? What, what is the time scale here? Yeah, I've run uh, generally, I run this <clears throat> this kind of model from about 1945 or 1950, 55, somewhere in there where the technology was just starting to take hold um, out to uh, you know, 2020 maybe, you know, 10 years beyond where we're at, 10, 11 years beyond where we're at. Okay. But you could, uh, you could zoom in in some detail uh, to the, the most recent past and, and the next few years if, if you, if you uh, as presumably you do, you want yes. to, to look at those periods in more detail. Okay. Yes, and in fact, I have a great example later in the presentation of exactly that because that's what a business person does is they look at two years back, one year forward, and uh, they really understand things best in those terms. Oh, great. Exactly. Right. Yeah. All right, so if, if we go on to then to the next um, slide. Um, this is the customer sector, and again, moving from left to right, we have potential contractors. As the industry, the heating, let's think of air conditioning industry is growing, um, more and more contractors are entering the picture. Their, their new businesses are being formed, and, and initially, the contractor makes a decision as to whether they're going to be a carrier loyal contractor, which is the box in the center top, or a rival brand loyal contractor, which is the box in the center bottom. And the idea is, and, and the historical experience is that initially contractors were 100% loyal to one brand because there weren't very many brands and because their livelihood in a new industry depended on the installed base of products. The larger the installed base of carrier products, the more likely their future was going to be a good future, the more units there were to work on. Uh, units were much less generic, so every brand was significantly different. So contractor makes a choice of uh, which brand they're going to be loyal to based on their perceived, um, their perception of the size of the installed base of that brand. And, and presumably there's quite an effort involved to get familiar with, uh, with a particular manufacturer's um, equipment and how it works and how to install it and all that kind of stuff as well. So, yes. uh, so being able to install lots of different brands uh, um, must be uh, must be quite an, quite an effort, quite an investment on the part of the contractor. Yeah, certainly um, back then when air conditioning first came out, it was um, it was a significant effort. Today it's a bit easier because um, products have become more similar. However, there still is proprietary content that is content unique to a carrier unit that without specific knowledge of that content, um, it you'd be more challenged to service that, that particular unit. That's correct. Okay. Um, so then a contractor would then uh, go up and down in the, in the middle part here where they're carrier loyal, and then they decide to be rival brand loyal, and then they decide to be carrier loyal. There's a certain amount of switching that they can do based on the amount of um, wholesaler strength. That is, the wholesalers in the local market is the one who's trying to, to gain that loyalty. And, and that is, in a large part, the amount of loyalty spend that, that we, uh, the loyalty spend marketing program. So that's people like you, right? That's me. That's the wholesaler. That's right. These are our customers, and we're trying to create as many carrier loyal contractors. And then on the far right, you can see both carrier loyal contractors and brand loyal contractors flowing into a stock, a square box of, of disloyal contractors. And this is as the industry matures and as the placement of the units takes over the adoption sales of the units. Contractors' uh, units are a little more generic. It's easier to work on many, many brands. And they gain some purchasing power by being able to say to me, well, I can get this other brand for less. Um, you know, if you want more of my sales, you have to provide me more services, things like that. And again, that's a part of the loyalty spend that was one of the critical parameters in this model. 
So this is showing the customer rivalry, and, and you can see type one where we're trying to, to make them dedicated, type two where they're, go they're dedicated but they're going back and forth between brands, and type three where they've just decided to carry multiple brands and now it's a matter of getting share. And, and that piece of it, how many loyal customers plus what share of the disloyal customers we have is what determines when a unit needs to be replaced, what percentage becomes a carrier unit, and what percentage becomes a rival brand unit. Okay, so the, the nature of the market today, which is where those vertical lines on the right are, on the right of the charts are, basically says most contractors now are disloyal, although there's a few who, are, who, who remain loyal. Is that, is that yes, what, uh, that's correct? There are a few that there's still economies to be gained by being loyal. I, I always describe it, or the people in the industry describe it as more of a religion. Either a contractor buys into the fact that um, that they're going to be a loyal contractor, or they're going to be a disloyal contractor. It's it's a, a business uh, decision that they make, and then they go forward from there. Okay. All right. Well, if we go to the first business benefit, so that's really the description of the model, and it and it was really meant to give you an overlay or a background on what I was what I was dealing with. Now I want to talk more about. Well, how did I present this? What did we learn, and how was it presented to management so that um, so that we get some business benefit? And I think one of the really neat um, things that came out of this was this chart, which shows um, homes with air conditioning. And I say it equals a stock here, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But stocks are not obvious to business people. That's that's really one of the, the first insights. But what this shows is the blue line are the installed base of carrier homes with carrier air conditioning, and the red line is the installed base of rival brands. And you can see that the heavy advertising spend early in the years uh, created an advantage of installed base for carrier. But um, while their advertising spend did not decrease per se, it just the dynamics of the marketplace decreased. Um, or changed, their installed base really uh, just leveled out, and the rival brands came on strong. They they never really spent much on uh, brand name advertising, pulled through consumer advertising. Most of their spend was spent on this uh, loyalty advertising, contractor loyalty, and and their high leverage came came on very much later in the uh, in the overall industry life cycle. And this did that uh, period of growth, Warren, uh, um, feature the arrival of more competitors, or, or was it just the same competitors um, being gradually becoming more more successful? Um, really, both. There's some great dynamics there that are not captured in, in my model. There's mine is just carrier and all others, but there were more rivals, and then within more rivals, that is more manufacturing firms, the brands began to proliferate. In other words, a company who had one brand in 1970 had 12 brands in 1980 had you know 15 to 20 oh, brands in 1990. That sounds surprising because uh, it is surprising. thought uh, that they'd be best putting their efforts behind a, a small number of well-known brands but um, that's, a, that's an interesting feature. I, I have a dynamic hypothesis on that. We don't have time. I'm, I'd love to model it but it was completely counterintuitive to me. That was the okay. last thing I expected was a wow. proliferation of brands but that would be the answer to your question. So uh, this did provide, you know, so I'm not sharing with my managers this detailed model, much of which I've shared with you. What I'm saying to them is, doesn't this, this graph is a graph of a stock which we don't have. We, we don't, the manufacturers do not have a stock of the total install base, let alone the install base of carrier versus rival brands. Remember that a stock is the sum total of the accumulations um, and depletions throughout history, and unless you've got all those and you're willing to rigorously go back and add them all up and, and you think you're not making mistakes, there's, unless you've been keeping track of it or can take a tally at, at some particular time, this is a very difficult uh, quantity to come up with. And I can just put in a little anecdote here, Warren, if, you, if, sure. you, if you'd excuse me. Um, many, many, many years ago, uh, actually when I was a student, um, we, we had a, a a request from uh, Otis Elevators to help them with their uh, market information on elevators in London. Um, and it was exactly the situation you, you described. They had no idea 
how many elevators from which manufacturer were, were in which buildings in London. So um, we uh, we took on a, a crowd of other students, and they went around literally knocking on on every building door, asking about um, how many elevators, what size, and uh, uh, what manufacturer, and so on, which um, caused uh, which was uh, basically okay in most cases, except of course when they. Um, uh, knocked on the door of uh, MI5, our, our secret service. <laughs> we weren't, weren't too keen to tell them about, uh, about their elevators. And how thick are your walls, right? And, and are they <laughs> concrete reinforced? <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's another of those situations where uh, yeah. many uh, many companies just don't know what that stock of, um, of people with their product actually is. Well, Otis, by the way, is a division of United Technologies, which is one of the largest global companies in, you know, in the world. Um, and you'd think if anybody would measure critical things, it would be them. But yeah. by the way, Carrier Corporation is also a division of United Technologies. So, oh, right. um, you know, it's the same. It's the same story. I've asked them; they don't know, and and they're they're very happy to get this sort of measurement. When I present this particular chart to my managers, they get it intuitively, and now it it, it clears away some of the clutter they have in their head. And it gives them a, a new mental model that implies dynamics that, that – um, and oftentimes I will give this to them without the vertical axis uh, numbers, right, because we're not trying to point predict. We're just trying to give them some concept for how things are changing. Hmm. Uh, so one of the first learnings here, one of the things that I think is important is that the measurement and collection of critical stock or resource values um, is, is a huge um, service. It's just a huge service to the small, medium-sized, even large corporations. They just plain have a lack of historical accumulation. They just don't have the values. In fact, they don't really know how these stock values have changed over time. And just doing a quick drawing, most of mine are by hand. I will put this chart in my head. I'll understand the dynamics completely. And I'll sit down with a person and pull out a piece of paper and draw it by hand, and we'll just start talking about why might this occur. Hmm. Um, and it gives them some intuitions they didn't previously have. Okay, so you're using you're using the picture of how things have probably changed over time. Yes. To raise those questions about well, why did this happen? What was it about the strategy and policies of the of, of us and, and our competitors? And, and exactly the right. Case, the causes to come about. And you're using that to kind of point towards options and, and questions for the future, I guess. Yeah. In fact, it's almost a defeatist argument. I, I've kind of thrown in the towel. Um, I've decided that the business managers are going to use a moving average method of forecasting or you know, some sort of uh, correlation method, regardless of what I tell them. But if I can give them an intuitive feel for the causal mechanism, if I can teach them the causal relationships that, that I've learned through the modeling process, then when they get their moving average forecast back, they never trust that either, right, because it's just wrong. But, but they have no, no intuition about what direction to modify it. And um, if I can give them that intuition, if I can teach them that intuition by hand drawing, which is something they're very comfortable with, um, dynamic relationships of key stock values, which, by the way, they don't have and have never seen, um, it gives them that intuition. Uh, my hope is it gives them the intuition they need to be able to do that modification um, and and make better decisions going forward. Not perfect decisions, but better decisions. Sure, sure. And that, that really leads me to my second key learning, and this is more just an observation, which is um, I, you know, I've talked about doing the hand-drawn charts. I, I often will draw one or two stocks with its associated flows, maybe one feedback, um, never the whole model. And the reason for that is, as I did share the whole model, a business person looks at that and says, oh, my gosh, I would never have time to do that. You must have invested just incredible time in this. And the only reason that anyone would invest all that time in a model like that is because it's a perfect point prediction model. The only reason I would put all that time into a model is because I can now foresee the future with perfect accuracy. This is sort of the, the bias that the business manager that I talk to has. And so by showing them the details of the model, which all it's really doing is capturing lots of dynamic behavior, 
to give me some certainty as to what I'm learning about the, the causal mechanisms is not a point prediction exercise, I'm sending exactly the wrong message. You know, on the third, the third page, or even on the second sector like I showed you today, they're saying, well, the only reason I would do this is perfect accuracy. And, and even if they don't say it, that's what they're assuming. Mm. And, and now I've got myself in a box because mm. I'm not point predicting. And all they want to know is, well, what's the number going to be? Right? They already know they, they can't understand the whole model. And so they just they want the answer. They're business people. They're busy. They need, they need to move on. And, and I put myself in a box I can't get out of. So this is the reason I start with hand-drawn charts, right? It's to say, look, what you need to understand are the basic learnings that I've learned because you can make better decisions if you have this intuition. And they like that because they live in a world of immense noise. And if I can help... Talking, uh, it's in terms of order of the magnitude, I guess, saying, uh, you know, should we be doubling our, our marketing effort in this or should we be yeah. uh, making, uh, you know, and, and is that going to raise our sales rate by 10% or, or 15%? It's not a case of, you know, it's going to be 31.2 million next week or whatever. Exactly right. And that's, that's what business managers, including myself, are used to making those decisions. We, uh, I prefer, especially smaller or medium-sized, we prefer not to tweak things, right? We, we want to yeah. make a big difference. And so give me the intuition that making this bet is more likely to have a payoff by quieting the noise that really is not a, a big part of, uh, of what I'm learning. And that's, that's what drawing this chart has done for me, is, is right. allowed me to, to quiet the noise and give people better intuition so that when they make their decisions, they're more informed. Great, great. Maybe it's based on a moving average, right, initially. Sure. All right, so there's some business benefit. Um, I, I want to just talk a bit about how stock details are not measured. Um, you know, what it's amazing to me what gets measured in businesses are flows. It, it sales rates, of course, are the kingpin of the flows. When stocks are measured, they're oftentimes turned into flows or some combination of flows, like inventory, which is clearly a stock. We rarely talk about inventory. What we talk about is inventory turnover, right? The productivity of that stock. Inventory turnover is a stock divided by a flow, and so we have this hybrid ratio. Um, day sales outstanding is a measure of how productive our receivables are. It's receivable balance, average balance, divided by a flow, our collection. So again, we're, we're hybridizing these stocks, and the reason we do that is because what we have detailed information about is flows. And if we want to look at, a, at any period of time and have a trend in a chart, we have to include flows. We can't include only the stock. And the reason is we don't have the information. Hmm. Stock measurements are aggregated. You know, this gets to, well, why don't you have the information? Stock measurements are aggregated typically in dollars. It's really only the financial accounting side of the business that says, you know what, you really need to know what the dollars of inventory you had by location were every month for the last, you know, 10 years. Rarely is the history of stocks kept in any detail. So, for example, I have 25,000 stock keeping units. I can tell you precisely at this moment how many of each one of those I have because we have to know that to be able to know what we can sell and what we can't sell. I can't even tell you what precisely by stock keeping unit what I had one month ago. I can tell you how many dollars I had um, by location, but we don't keep snapshots of precisely the SKUs, you know, by warehouse, um, by day or week or month or even year. So you're not actually tracking the, the stocks and the flows of inventory arriving and being sold and, and, the, and those movements? We've got all the flows you could ever want. I've got, uh, you know, what we sold to who at what millisecond, yeah. uh, what they bought it with, what the margin was. Flows are a big deal in business for whatever reason. Yeah. What I had in inventory at the end of 2007, I know the dollar amount. By uh, I, see what, I see your point, yeah. yeah. But I don't know the individual SKUs. Uh, maybe a better example is customers. This is a critical resource to a business. I know precisely who we sold to today and who we sold to yesterday and how much they bought over any period of time. But if I wanted to look at the stock of customers, the customer counts day by month, I would have a very hard time doing that. In fact, we have to 
come up with some definition like, well, they were a customer if the flow rate was greater than or equal to this at any point within the six-month period, you know, something like this, because what we have is flows. Yeah. We don't know their type. We don't know their size. We don't know their loyalty level. We have estimates of all that stuff right now, the snapshot right now, but we're not capturing it in a database such that we could plot the change in loyalty for any given customer. Right. Our, our sales reps should know that, but they're human, and, and they're not keeping it you know, rigorously. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the reasons we don't adopt, have not adopted customer relationship management or CRM software is because it does a good job of collecting flows and what's going on right now with the customer, but again, it's not keeping kind of the history of their loyalty or their size or, and I just think that it's really missing the boat as a result. Oh, right. Oh, that's a, that's a very interesting observation. I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye out for that one. Yeah. Um, and then employees, another great example. I can tell you precisely who works for me right now. We can do an assessment of their experience and skills. But if you ask me that question at the end, you know, how many employees did I have at the end of 2007, I could tell you because only because we're starting to keep track of that information. But I couldn't tell you without recreating it what their names were, how many years of experience they had, and what skill sets we had at that time, right. and how they've changed right. between then and now. And these are really critical things. As, as we know in system dynamics, it's stocks that provide the, pretense, the potential for sustainable competitive advantage, right? Right. right? The ones that are difficult to build and slow to ebb that provide competitive advantage is really where the sustainable competitive advantage comes from, and yet we don't know what they are. Right. So, so the punchline here is if you want to help a small or medium-sized business, or really any business, identify the key stocks through a modeling process and put measurement and recording procedures, help them to put those procedures in place so that they can start to look at the history, and then allow the model to estimate historical values you know, within reason so that we can build some intuition about these, these critical values. If they have flow values, you're going to end up spending all your time converting flows into stocks, right? That's what it's really, what the modeling effort is all about. Okay. In In intriguing insight. Um, all right. So that's, um, you know, really about stocks are just not measured. Here's another business benefit. Um, we started out the modeling process. This is actually pretty interesting, a pre pretty detailed model, and we, we wanted to know about how advertising spend affects things, how the loyalty spend affects things, um, how does the size of the installed base affect things. We eventually sort of worked our way into, into that question. And the model is particular in, particularly interesting to a system dynamicist, I think, because it combines this S-shaped industry growth, right, accelerating, decelerating to, to an S-shaped growth with um, a couple of forms of rivalry, brand rivalry and contract or loyalty or contract or rivalry. Um, and so there's some very, very interesting dynamics there. But the learning that I got was um, that it was the most valuable thing from this model was really the big picture. Forget about all these details, all these fine questions that we had to begin with. Indeed, another chart, it really wasn't about those details. It was about this chart, air conditioning sales per year. Now, this is a flow rate. I'm not focused on the stock, but I'm focused on a, an incredible insight which people just couldn't see without this chart. And this one I've probably drawn 100 times for different folks, some folks multiple times. So one of the one of the key insights to this model was not a lot of the detail it provided, but rather the summary chart, which does not include um, you know, who has the air conditioner or what type of customer is recommending what. It's it's an aggregation of the sales rate of all air conditioning units. The green line is the adoption rate. This is selling air conditioners into homes that never had air conditioning. And you can see it starts slowly and it grows at an increasing rate. And then as penetration begins to occur, we continue to sell into homes that don't have air conditioning, but at a decreasing rate um, and until the homes are, are being filled up and we've reached saturation. The purple line uh, is 
the replacement rate, which starts out very slowly because it's related to the installed base. As the installed base increases through adoption sales, the opportunity for replacement sales increases, and it grows uh, increasing rate and then at a decreasing rate kind of match the installed base. The line that's most important is the black line. That's the total of the two. Just add the two together, the adoption sales and the replacement sales. The black line is the only line the industry has. They, they really right. Right. they have no yeah. clue. Because they don't know what the installed base is, they really don't know. I don't know as a wholesaler when I sell a condensing unit, an air conditioner, whether it's going into a home that's never had it or whether it's a replacement. I just don't know. The contractor would know, but the information is not captured. Yeah, yeah. So if, if all you're tracking is the black line, uh, you, you're getting very happy in 1980 and a bit miserable in uh, in 1990 and a bit happier again in, in uh, 2005. But, exactly. but you're not seeing um, what the drivers are that are causing that. And if you don't see where that's coming from, you don't know which levers to pull to to make your particular sales go go uh, more or less uh, more or less strongly i guess is that it? that's exactly right so the the system dynamics and business insight here is um, you know oftentimes it's just the big picture it's about giving the manager insight into the big picture and arming them with causal causal explanations and and i've drawn this chart probably 100 times and the reason i've drawn it and I'm going to talk more about this in the next slide, is, is that yellow circle right there. It's, that dynamic is completely counterintuitive to um, this growth and contraction, is completely counterintuitive to somebody whose entire career has been spent on the growth side of this curve. Right, right. And it has, yeah. Im it has immense implications um, at all levels of the channel if we don't prepare for it. I guess we've seen uh, quite a lot of that over the last uh, two years with all the uh, boom and bust that's uh, landed us in the current mess we're in in all kinds of other industries, right? Um, well, uh, there's going to be something that's been going on. Right? Let's talk about that in just a minute. Cause I'm going to give you an example from my experience that um, I think sheds a lot of light on that exact question. So we'll go to the next slide. Imagine, if you will, um, that I am sitting in a room, and I typically do this in multiple meetings, but let's pretend I'm sitting in a room and I've got all of my key business partners are here, my suppliers, manufacturers, my fellow wholesalers, non-competing wholesalers in, in similar territories, my customers, and our, our single purpose is to look at this chart, which is the same industry movement chart. It's the same. This is furnaces and air conditioners, but it's unit movement over time. Um, and we're, we want to, we're doing the typical business thing. We're doing a moving average, right, three, four years back, one year forward, two years forward. And uh, our purpose is to forecast this industry unit sales. It has everything to do with our marketing plans, what we're going to spend, you know, what we're going to do. The problem is we've got incredible disagreement on the basic direction of the industry movement, right? Because the conversation is about many of the issues that, that Kim, you were just bringing up, the overall U.S. economy, are interest rates going up or down? How does that affect our sales? The home construction business cycle, right? As new construction grows, our sales typically grow. As that business cycle goes down, the opportunity to sell air conditioning into new homes goes down. Um, and so we're just we're having this very heated conversation. And finally, I say, stop. It's time. You know, we're business people. We, we've got busy lives. We have to decide where we're going to go. And and I would say, you know. Most of the people in the room, not everyone, but everybody is saying, look, we, you know, we have this moving average thing going on. Look, at, there's some noise in, those, in, in the red line there. The, those are actual numbers, so it's pretty noisy. But, but we see kind of a return to uh, the growth. That's what we know. That's what we've done in the past. It's how our sales force is structured, you know, on and on and on. Um, a few people in the room, maybe the, a third, two-thirds are hope prediction, and maybe a third say, well, I don't know. There's, you know, I, I think there's an adoption rate and there's a replacement rate, and I think more and more of our sales are replacement, and uh, you know, the replacement rate has to level out at some point. And this, this moving average appears to be decelerating to me. Right? They're getting pretty sophisticated, and they're beginning to describe a dynamic hypothesis. They're beginning to describe how they, they're modifying the moving average with some intuition, which is fabulous. Right? But it's a, it's a minority. And then one person in the room who is incredibly courageous, right, is going to 
is just flying in the face of what everybody is saying, says, yeah, but what if, what if, what if the industry contracted? And immediately everybody says, the economy is not going to contract forever. The interest rates have to recover. The, the new home construction cycle has been up and down in years past. What could possibly cause it to be bad forever? Um, you know, all the things that we know affect our business uh, just can't affect us the way that you're, that, that you're implying. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and so that person pretty much gets shouted down. One of the things that system dynamics can do, and one of the learnings is just plain putting this discussion in context is very valuable. So what if we were to look at the big picture from 1955 to the year 2000? Big difference there, right? Now we're seeing the adoption, and, and clearly the, the best guess people, the people that are sort of 30%, their intuition that things might be leveling out seems more reasonable now. We're willing to discuss things beyond the business cycle, beyond interest rates. Because one of my arguments about this chart is, uh, look in the 70s, this is the oil embargo that hit the US, the, the 80s, the Reagan years, boom, boom years. I can go through this chart and pretty much every peak and valley I can tell you the economic cycle that was going on that caused the minor movement. But none of those things explain the basic fundamental dynamic behavior that we're seeing. Indicator at all of the of the fear future, do they? And it still isn't really giving an indication of the fear future. It's really more pointing at. I mean, our, at the time, the business intuition, as we started to talk about dynamic hypothesis, was really around. Yeah, it's hard to find an adoption sales, so I can see our sales leveling out. I can see that happening, right? Yeah. But um, oh, okay. So understanding the big picture is a big part of this, um, and these substantial causal mechanisms can be discovered through the modeling process and then taught to business managers. They're going to use their moving average, but if you can give them a sense of, um, of causal mechanisms and some confidence around those, they will modify that moving average. And in this case, I think I was very successful in getting people, suppliers and customers, to understand that it wasn't going to continue to grow. It was going to level out. They were willing to buy into that even though the moving average at the time wasn't, um, you know, wasn't indicating that. So we'll go back to this AC sales per year uh, and talk about it's, it's the rate we're watching is a sum of the adoption sales plus the replacement sales equals the total known sales. And with this chart now, I've been able to give people the intuition that, in fact, a contraction is possible. It is possible. In fact, depending on some of the assumptions we make, it turns out that product durability is one of the biggest assumptions. The longer the product durability, the larger the contraction is likely to be. Of course, air conditioning and furnaces have 15 to 20 year durability, so this is not good. Um, it's not like homes, but it's not like Kleenex or diapers either. So, so here it is. These are the actual industry numbers now, right? It's 2008. Uh, we have a forecast for 2009. And you can see that the contraction has, in fact, occurred. And the big question, you know, I, I knew this in 2002, 2003. I knew that something like this was happening. I, I did my best to convince people through the mechanisms that we just talked about. Um, now that they're seeing it, it's lending even more credibility to, you know, the dynamic hypotheses that we were talking about are now becoming part of the industry lore. They're becoming part of the industry fabric. That, that, that's fascinating. And, and presumably that gives you some ability to, uh, to plan for the future management of your own business, right, uh, in, in some way, and also to think about um, your, your competitive um, situation, you know, how, you, how you're going to get on relative to, to the, the, the guys you're competing with. Yeah, that's a great point. And so let me give, I'll just give you a couple of anecdotal answers to that. In, in 2002, 2003, it wasn't obvious. It was obvious to me. I, I changed the culture, restructured the business. 
we had some layoffs at a time that no one was laying off. And when over the years between then and now, when people left, we didn't replace them. We reassigned job duties. Um, and so that was pretty um, far sighted in the industry. I can tell you today, it, it's like a weekly basis I'm getting emails about competitors that are laying people off. Ah, so, so you are actually um, uh, rationalizing it in anticipation at exactly yeah. the time when everybody else was was throwing in uh, all, the, all they could to grow, right? Yeah, gearing up for big growth. That's exactly right. And I was not gearing up for big growth. A very defeatist attitude, in, in, you know, in, in the common perspective. Yeah. But indeed, we were able to conserve company resources during that time. Um, we didn't fail any customers. We didn't cut back to the point where, you know, we weren't serving customers. Yeah. We were conserving resources, and now we're largely right-sized. You know, we're not – this year we are not having um, – any sort of job job reductions. I think an even more telling anecdotal uh, example, though, is the speech my my father gave me. You know, one of many, and and one of the things he told me was, um, you know, one thing you can do, but it would be a big waste of your time, is to go after your competitors' customers, because um, the industry grows. There's more than enough customers to go around. It's really about the advertising and making, getting customers, new customers to be loyal to you. And, you know, pissing off a competitor and getting in their shorts and creating a whole, a whole uh, uh, contest over customers is, is a waste of your time when the industry is growing faster than we can really keep up with it. Right. Um, and this was war. I mean, this was uh, not just me. This was everybody in the company believed that, you know, this was our birthright. This was our entitlement. This, this growing marketplace. Indeed, people looking at this chart whose careers spanned even 35 or 40 years, all they knew was growth, period. Right, right. And so, you know, it affected the way we budget. It affected the way we hire people. It affected the way we sell. It affected everything. And, and as I realized the dynamic was for things to change, I realized it was going to take me four or five years to change that culture, that I needed to do it as quickly as I could, and I needed to get people to understand that it was all about the contractor and selling and not about the supplier, that it was all about going after our competitors' customers and getting predatory, ah. that, it, that it was a zero-sum market share game, period, right? And this was very difficult to sell 10 years ago and, wow. and not so difficult to sell, obviously, today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a remarkable, uh, remarkable change. Uh, so, so I even got a phone call from a competitor, which I don't often admit to, but, you know, so he called me up and he said, Warren, did your father not bring you up correctly? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, you just hired my best salesman and you just recruited two of my customers. That's not how we do it in this industry, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't just my father. It was industry lore. It really was. Right. Um, and so that might have been 2004 or 2005. So you, you get um, a few less uh, Christmas cards these days. I absolutely do. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, like I said, we, we were able to reserve, conserve our resources, and we are now positioned for what I think is the future. Um, it, you'll notice that the high oscillations and the peak of that curve, that's beer game stuff. As the industry um, levels out and begins to uh, – to, 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 uh, to reach equilibrium, I'm predicting incredible oscillations. We're trying to prepare ourselves for those oscillations. We're trying to figure out what we can do to dampen those oscillations. We're reducing our skew count. And a lot of things we're doing now in preparation for what I think the future dynamics are going to look like. As future dynamics in the past were contracted, and the future dynamics going forward are going to be these wild oscillations that we need to figure out how to dampen and survive. Right, right. If we had more time, we could talk about uh, uh, the opportunities that those kinds of um, swings give you to uh, pick up uh, the uh, the uh, victims who will uh, fall by the wayside in exactly. difficult times. Um, uh, but uh, as I say, we, we're a bit pushed for time, so I think we're yeah. better to press on. So, you know, my that's one of the big learnings and an example of, of that learning. Um, and there it is, right there. There's That's what really happened, or uh, where it really is happening. Those are actual numbers, the extent that we measure these actual numbers. And again, those are flow rates, not... Um, 
So I, we, I think we talked about seeing the big pictures allows room for these causal explanations. Um, it allows them to challenge their assumptions. Business managers don't appreciate the complexity of the model, but they are capable of developing intuition with which they modify their existing forecast. So they get it, and they, right. they love they love understanding these causal models, or at least the intuition, because it quiets the, the, the noisy nature of the yeah. data. They gain yeah. confidence. Yeah. Uh, what, what I love about this story, Warren, is, that, is your ability to anticipate and make the right strategic changes at a time when it didn't look like those were the right things to do. But, but right. the, the fundamentals of the system said, this is the right thing to do. It is what we should be doing. Uh, and that's, um, you know, I've been, I've been commenting on this on, on my blog and just asking, you know, why didn't people see this coming? Right. Uh, because it's not just in, in your sector that these mechanisms have been, have been at work. Uh, so, um, yeah, a big, big round of applause to you for that. So the, the reason they're not seeing it is because they're doing moving average forecasting two years back, one year forward. That's one reason. And two, they're looking exclusively at flows, and the flows contain no history. Right. right. Flows contain none of the really good information, right? And that's why I've said the learning principles that I've said. Um, uh, another, uh, oh, oh, so kind of summing up, System Dynamics as a business tool, uh, something I haven't talked a lot about is it, it's a great communication tool. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's really true. Um, whether it's hand drawing these these in, these uh, time series data to provide instinct to the manager, or whether it's sketching a, a three stock model about what's going to happen when the ten seer lower efficiency units get phased out and the higher seer is all that's available. You know what's going to happen in these stock values. What sh what questions should we be asking? Hmm. Um, uh, very very valuable. And, and it's not a modeling process. It's not a matter of sitting in front of a computer. It's, it's largely done by hand. As a result, I mean, if I'm the modeler and I am imparting that knowledge as a, as a result of the model, I better know the dynamics cold, right? right? Because the manager knows their stuff, and they're going to ask me really good questions about the dynamics. They're not dumb. They're just unarmed with the information they need. Right. And I'm arming it with them, and then they're armed with it, and they're going to ask me even better questions, the ones I may not have anticipated. So the modeling effort is very valuable, but it's the picture that's worth a thousand words. Um, I said earlier, differentiating between stocks and flows, businesses have all the flows you'd ever want, but it's the value of the information that's in the stock. Um, and then there are these sort of hidden stocks and flows. Um, I would argue that the adoption sales rate is a hidden flow. We're just thinking, our mental model is thinking about nothing but the replacement rate, which means things might eventually level out, but when they do, they're going to be at an even level, no possibility for contraction, right? And that hidden flow of the adoption rate, which we knew about, but we weren't keeping track of, is what really causes that um, the, the collapse, the initial collapse. The communication tool, uh, we talked about seeing the big t picture. The, um, the more subtle point here is that by following the system dynamics process of inquiry, I am asking better questions. I'm, I'm thinking about causal mechanisms as opposed to correlation. And the questions I'm asking are more often, as a business person, now I've got my business hat on, my questions are more often on target than just, you know, noise questions. I'm, oh gosh, there's this noise out there. I'm really concerned about it. I'm going to get married or research it for a week, when in fact it's a red herring, right? This causal stuff really helps me to, to focus in and eliminate the noise. Um, and always, always expand the time horizon. It wasn't until we looked at the big picture and so I had to go to my suppliers. I had to get mainframe uh, data that had been archived. Some of it was in paper files. It was collected by cities early on, not by counties. The type of equipment had changed. There was a ton of work to put that simple slide together, right, to make it all work. But all that, uh, all that work, that's uh, uh, a lot of research to do. But it was so, uh, yeah, it took like a year to just in delays to get the information and make it consistent and match it with population data and junk like that. You know, people will often push back on, on doing this work on the basis of, oh, you know, it's far too much work and, and so on. But if you look at, at what you got out of it, 
you know, the ability to make a fundamental strategic shift in your business, was it worth it? Well, it looks, it looks to me like it was. Right? Yeah, for me personally, I told you I had fallen in love with system dynamics. I had done it full time even if I wasn't running the business, right? So I got a lot of personal gratification. But I think from my shareholder's perspective, it absolutely was worth it. I delegated more of the day-to-day -day work, so I had time to work on what others couldn't, right? Right. Um, and that was really my job as CEO is to steer the business not to write orders. Right, um, exactly. And, yeah. and so... Yeah, I, not only was it worth it, but I think it helped me to do what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So uh, the last point I make is it's really it's a confidence builder, and that's kind of a quieting phenomenon. So much noise out there. People are always throwing things in my face. Well, what if? What about? And if I have this background dynamic hypothesis that I have confidence in, it really quiets my space, and it allows me to repeat myself in meaningful ways to my employees and allows them to understand the whole mission, vision, um, mantra so that it doesn't change. It's very consistent. Um, you know, it changes far less frequently and you know, makes me very happy, which is why I've got this mantra. <laughs> really makes for a much higher quality life. Yeah, that's great. So in summary, um, it's an intuition system dynamics in business is an intuition, a new way of thinking sorting out, quieting the details. It's a guided curiosity. It really, the, the, the methodology, system dynamics methodology really helps to ask the right questions, focus on the right thing. It's a tremendous communication tool. Quick sketches, um, really important charts to get people to understand them, things they haven't seen. It's a confidence builder um, in an otherwise very noisy environment. And, uh, I guess the last point I'd make is absolutely the modeling is still required. I don't want anybody to think that this could all just be done because my intuition is so strong. My intuition, it, it didn't get strong about these dynamics until I had gone through many, many iterations of this modeling process, including the model which I showed you, which is one of my most recent iterations of this, of this effort. Um, and that's it. That's, that, that's the, the sum total of the presentation. That's fantastic, Warren. That's uh, you really are a star. That's a great explanation of uh, a really good application of um, dynamic thinking and, and modeling. To uh, uh, what I really loved about it was um, your summary of just those three or four real big changes to the the strategic direction of your of your business that came out of doing that. Um, and that's uh, that's something that a lot of companies right now um, should be regretting that they that they didn't do. Um, I, uh, we've we've used a heck of a lot of your time, Warren. I'm, I'm enormously grateful for that. Um, could, could I just ask you one one extra question? Sure. Yeah. Um, this this uh, particular thing you've been looking at is a very very long time scale situation. Have you also used the approach? for looking at, at more medium-term uh, issues and, and, and dynamics in, in any way? Um, I, I guess the answer is no, but yes. Uh, the, the, the dynamics that I presented today are, are the fundamental ones that I've been focused on. And, and as a business manager, as president and CEO, a big part of my job is meeting with suppliers and customers. And so the storytelling that I love, right, the storytelling of, of system dynamics allows me to tell a rich story and help everybody to be on the same page. So just a few fundamental um, understandings go a long way. But the yes part is, as I mentioned, I believe going forward our lives are going to be um, dictated by these oscillations, which is a, a shorter-term phenomenon. Right. Um, you know, goal-seeking loops with a delay. And, and as I've begun that process, I am, of course, focusing on, it's really not about 1955 to this present, it's really about the last 10 years or the next 10 years and, and what, what are the dynamic hypotheses there. I, I, I think my time frame is going to shrink here pretty soon, yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, as CEO, of course, you, your time, your horizon should be more than the next 12 months or the next or the next yeah. two years, so uh, yeah, yeah I, can, I can see that. Um, I, I was just wondering about, about whether, for example, you might... Uh, um, you probably want me to cut this out of the recording, but uh, uh, whether you might 
uh, be using it for for thinking about you know, particular competitive initiatives that, that you're taking if you've seen one or two weak competitors in your area and uh, say okay well you know it, it actually is all about capturing the install base from from uh, from people who can't can't match up with our kind of capability um, and whether you could actually kind of put something up on your wall and say well yeah this is the the initiative we're following, you know, this is how it's going. We've been at it for three months, and we've captured, you know, this number of key customers, and we've, uh, you know, this guy is looking like he's going to withdraw from the industry and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm uh, betraying my uh, my competitive instincts here. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, you know, so whatever I can't talk about, I won't talk about. But I can give you um, a great example of the the kind of chart on the wall. Um, we realized that it was going to be about recruiting customers. I, I already explained that. We realized we had to be predatory. And so we started keeping track of the number of customers won, right? We, we started keeping track of the, 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 the uh, change in the stock of customers and how frequently were, were we winning customers. And let's just, for the sake of argument, say that we had uh, 2,500 customers and it was a pretty stable base of customers in terms of the count, and uh, we were earning maybe 20 customers per year. These would be pretty sizable contracting firms, so we're able to recruit that many. Um, and then we really put an effort into it, and we're now recruiting, say, 40 contracting customers per year, and we were able to grow our stock of customers from the 2,500 to, say, 2,800, something, something along those lines. And so I've got these two charts, which I don't have in front of you as in the presentation, but, but you can see this level base of customers and then a concerted effort, which results in a higher customer ad rate of 40 customers, from 20 to 40 customers per year. And now we've got this nice, this higher stable rate of, uh, or, or stock of customers, uh, 2,800. And the question I asked my staff was, are you happy with this? And of course, their answer was, of course, we put in all this work. We went from 2,500 to 2,800 customers. Um, why wouldn't we be happy with that? And my answer was a quick system dynamics model, where I drew a box, and I wrote customers inside, and I drew an arrow that goes into the box, which is the inflow. And I said, you're right. Our inflow rate went from 15 to 20. But let's talk about that period of time before we made the effort where our customer base was a pretty stable 2,500. What are you missing? If 15 customers, or I said 20 customers, are flowing into customers every year, and our customer's number is not changing, 2,500 is a good stable base at 2,500, what are we missing? There's an outflow of 20 customers per year. And what is it now? Well, we're recruiting 40 customers, and we've got a nice, good, stable base of 2,800 customers. What are we missing? Guess Gosh. what? We just doubled our outflow. Uh -huh. and, and so my, my point to um, my managers is, you know, it might be a little bit, instead of working so hard to gain customers, we may find that the overall goal is to grow the stock of customers. We might find that just plugging the hole might be a more effective strategy. Right, right. And I need you to, so this is that guided inquiry, right? This is the, my questions now are, who are we losing? Why are we losing? And it's, believe me, this is something that salespeople do not want to keep track of. These are losses. Right. This is right. this involves shame and not getting the job done, and so they're not recording this stuff. Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of questions to be asked. But I'm I believe going forward that our growth, our predatory growth strategy, needs to be at least fifty fifty about plugging the outflow and gaining the inflow, if not more about plugging the outflow, because right. it's getting harder and harder to convert truly loyal competitive customers. Yeah, yeah. As, a, as the industry matures, as you say, right. it, that just gets more difficult. So there's a chart, I mean, you know, that we've got on the wall, and we're asking a lot of questions about, um, and it was all, that's, from a system dynamics standpoint and a modeling standpoint, that's as simple as it gets. Right, gets absolutely. The yeah. intuition of inflow and outflow and using, just hand-drawing that stock on the board at a staff meeting over and over and over again and asking the question, what have we done about this? Why are we losing customers? And, and they, they'll come back and tell me, you know, I really get it. I love that picture. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. 
Laura, that's been absolutely excellent. Thank you very ever so much for that. Um, 